word. To be transformed by what you would say. Touch our hearts now as we open them up to you and speak, whether through me or in spite of me. For this we pray. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning comes from this long segment of teaching that Jesus is, is giving to his disciples as the end of his life or the end of his ministry comes. It is a time when Jesus realizes that, that the crucifixion is about to happen and that, that there's all these things that he has to tell his disciples before he goes. All these things that they need to know. And so it's this really, really long dissertation on, on all the kingdom and, and the mission and the duties of the disciples. And, and right smack in the middle of all of that teaching is, is this parable. As I told you before, I, I preached on this about six months ago. It was the first sermon I gave here, Leading for Discipleship. And I talked about how the parable of talents, in terms of them being talents and things like that, in terms of us using them to serve. This time I'm going to talk about it with a similar bend, but, but from a slightly different angle. Um, and so hopefully the message is still slightly different, but it's why today's sermon is called The Parable of the Challenge Redone. It's a, sort of like a second shot at it, so to speak, even though I probably have many shots at it in the future. Um, but anyways, that's part of what we'll kind of talk about. So I'll decide to, I'll begin with the uh, retelling of the story. So the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a master who had a vineyard and was about to go on a journey. And the master had, had three servants. And he gave five, five talents to the first servant to, to go and use. And he gave five talents to the second servant and one talent to the third. Now, the first servant took these five measures of of money and went and traded with them and invested them and, and made some deals and, and eventually made she made five more talents with the five that were given to her. And the second servant, he went out and he started buying and selling some stuff, doing a little bit of trading and, and he took his two talents and he, he also made two more. Now, the third servant, he he was unsure of his, his skills. He was, he was afraid of, of how the master would react if, if he were to lose his. He was afraid of what could happen if he were to put it out there in the world and let it come back. And so he took the talent that he had and, and out of fear for himself, he, he buried it in the ground. When the master came back and settled accounts, the first servant came and said, Master, here are your five talents, and here are five more that I was able to earn with them. And the master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. I gave you a little, and you've done well, so now I will give you much to be in charge of. And the second servant came up, and, and he said, Master, here are the two talents that you gave me, and here are two more that I was able to earn with them with those talents. And the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. I also gave you little to be in charge of, and you also showed that you can handle it well. You did well. So now you also will be put in charge of much. And the third servant came up and said, master, I, I know that you are gifted and talented in being able to make money and things multiply where, where others cannot and, and I, I was afraid I was afraid that I, I couldn't do that I was afraid that, that what you'd given me wasn't enough that there wasn't enough to, to be able to risk and so I took what you gave me and I buried it in the ground but see master faithfully I give it back to you I give you what is yours the master said you wicked and lazy slave you know that I am gifted and talented and able to reap where I did not, so unable to, to gain where others cannot. And you could have put this in a bank, and when I came back, I would have gotten interest at least. But no, you, you chose to, to bury it in the ground out of fear. 
Now I take it away from you, and I'm giving it to the one who has ten. And you're being thrown out to the outer darkness. I think this parable is a foreshadowing. Jesus is trying to tell his disciples what is to come. And if we are to maybe embrace that idea and expand on it, we may be able to see that perhaps Peter, James, and John might be considered the servants that are given five talents, that, that Jesus is, is the master and he knows that his time is coming to an end, that he is going to have to go away and leave them behind for a while. And so Peter, James, and John, whom Jesus spends so much more time with than the other disciples, and, and whom Jesus teaches so much more, he entrusts them with, with his teachings and with the, the responsibilities to lead the rest of the disciples. And Peter, James, and John, they, they take that opportunity and they seize upon it and, and they create disciples and they make disciples and they perform miracles and they do all of these great things. And we hear more about how Peter and James and John are so faithful and always there. And even though they stumble occasionally, there's just so much more that we learn about them in the story. And then if we consider those to be the, the, the servants with five talents, maybe the other disciples like Bartholomew and Nath Nathaniel and, and Andrew and, and Jude and all of James the and all those other ones. Maybe, maybe they're the maybe they're the servants with two talents. That Jesus spent a good amount of time with them and taught them as well, and they also perform miracles and make disciples. Maybe not on the scale that Peter and, and James and John do, but but they take what Jesus has given them and they they turn it into something greater. And if we're following this line, then then we have the servant with the one talent. Maybe that's Judas. Maybe that's the disciple who knew that Jesus was the Son of God. He believed in Jesus. But when he heard that, that Jesus was going away, that Jesus wasn't going to be there, he became afraid, afraid for himself. And he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. He took all that faith, all that love, all that teaching that Jesus put into him, and he stored it in himself, and hoped that it would be enough for his own salvation. And that 30 pieces of silver, the interesting thing is, is it became the price for the field where they buried his body. His 30 pieces of silver, that, that price, that thing that he gave it up for became the place where he was buried. If we consider this line of reasoning, if we consider this story to maybe be a foreshadowing of what is going to happen even among the disciples themselves, maybe there's something else that we can learn from it too. Maybe God and Jesus are trying to tell us that, that some of us He's going to bless with this incredible amount of faith and love. That he's going to, to grow so close with us that, that we are going to be the type of disciple, the type of servant that, that changes the world. Some of us may be the type of servant of Jesus on the level of Mother Teresa and, and Pope John Paul II and Martin Luther King Jr. and, and John Wesley, people who, who took the love and the faith that God invested with them and changed the way that we think about religion itself, the way that we come to know God itself. And, we, and they made an impact on thousands and millions of lives because of the faith and love that God invested in them and their investment into the world. They took what he gave them and they multiplied it in the world. They invested it, they, they did their trading and the thing is, is that no matter how much love and faith they gave out into the world, their faith and their love never diminished. It just grew and more people had it. But they weren't any lesser for it. And maybe, maybe some of us aren't 
quite comfortable being called to that level, that, that we don't know that we're the, the next Mother Teresa in the world or the next Martin Luther King Jr., but, but maybe we're the disciples that are called to, to change the lives in our community or the lives of people that we know, the people that we can put a name and face to. Maybe we're the disciples that have two talents. And, and when Jesus invests in us the love and faith that he has placed in us, we feel confident enough to go out and, and to tell our friends and, and to do things here in, in this area and, and to make a difference here for Jesus because he's invested that much in us. Maybe, maybe that means that some of us are the ones that only receive one measure of faith and love. The ones that, that seem to have just enough for themselves. They know who Jesus Christ is. They know that he is the Son of God. They know that he died for sins. But there's something about faith that, that they just, they feel that it's about their own personal salvation. That, that to them, Christianity is about them living a more moral life, of them being righteous, of them somehow obtaining their own personal entry into the kingdom of God, but that it really doesn't matter what's going on with the rest of the world and sharing faith. That, that to them, Christianity is about coming to church on Sunday morning, sitting in a pew and hearing a good sermon, or a bad one. And, and being a good person and acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord and, that, and that's good enough for them. The problem is, is that's not what Christianity is about. You know, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, almost any other religion you can find in the world will tell you how to live right. They will tell you all about the moral values and what is good and what is right, or right and what is wrong and what is what is bad for you? Christianity, Christianity almost alone talks about not only living right and treating others well, but, but actually going above and beyond that and actually loving others and doing for others. And there's something in Christianity that says that, that it is not about us and our salvation, but it is about Jesus saving the world. And he does throw, so through us. And when we live into that, it is then that we find our salvation. That, that it is not about a personal relationship with God that is only for us. But it is about a personal relationship with God that leads us out into personal relationships with others. That allow them to have a personal relationship with God. the difference between this faith and, and all those other faiths. It's not just about living right. And in fact, when we actually begin to love and share and invest what God places in us and others, and we are more concerned in trusting God and going out and doing that for them, we'll find that we are living right because we don't have time to do all the bad stuff. If we're so invested in the world, and making it a better place. We won't be distracted by the, by the sins. And God will be able to take care of them for us. Some of us are called to make a change on a global level. To make an impact beyond anything that we ever could possibly imagine. And I think that when Christ comes back and He calls us to settle our accounts, those of us who are, who are given that kind of faith and love, that desire to change the world, I think that when He comes back, we will be standing there and we will say, Master, here is the faith and love that You placed in me. I give it back to You. But look, behold, I took that faith and love that you gave me. And all of these people got to experience it because you gave it to me. Here, here is, here is the faith and love you gave me back. And here is the multiplication that I was able to do with it.
because you entrusted me to it. And I think that the people that were given that, that two measures of faith and talent, when they come to the reckoning and, and they bring their family, or they come forward and they say, here, Master, Jesus, here is the love and faith that you invested in me, and, and here are my family, and here are the people in the community that, that I personally knew that, that because of the faith and love that you put into my life, that you entrusted to me, and these people were able to come to know you too. I give you back what you have given to me. And I offer you these as well. And I think that those who come to the reckoning and they say, Master, thank you for loving me. Your love has inspired me to change the way I live. I stopped drinking and smoking. I stopped gambling. I stopped carousing and doing all these other things because I knew how much you loved me. And I have lived such a good life because of that. Thank you. Here is your love back. I, I give it to you with my whole heart. And in peace. I think Jesus will say, well... Why didn't you love the others? Why, why didn't you offer food to the man who was starving if you loved me so much? Why, why didn't you visit the sick if you loved me so much? Why, why didn't you offer healing if, if you loved me so much? Why, why did you ignore the other people that I love? And the interesting thing is, is, I don't think that the level of faith and love that God gives you has anything to do with how talented you are, or how holy or pious you are, or where you're starting in the faith. I don't think it has anything to do with how much knowledge that you have, though don't get me wrong, if your heart's in the right place, the knowledge will help later. I think that what determines what servant you are and how much faith and love God pours into you is a matter of who you are and how your heart is for the world to begin with. That if you are a person who aspires to change the world here and now, you are a person that comes to Jesus already expecting Him to do great things, then Jesus pours into you that extra faith and love that allows you to flourish and allows your heart to just overwhelm itself with all of that love which has to be flowing out from you that can't be bottled up, and you begin to change the world on that global scale because that is who you are and God saw that in you. And He invests in that. And he makes sure that that doesn't go to waste, that, that that desire and that drive in your heart to do something great for the world in his name happens. If you are a five-talent disciple, there is no way that you can fail. You won't let yourself fail, and God will make sure that you don't. If you are a two-talent disciple, that same love that's there, it is overflowing and it is building in you and it has to pour out. And maybe, maybe it's not as, as great and grand as, as someone like Mother Teresa and it's not a global thing, but, but it is still precious in God's sight and it is still valued by God and it is still something that God wants to see. And that love that you have to change your community and even just, just to see a few lives made better on behalf of Jesus Christ is enough for him to invest in you and he will make sure that you have what you need to change at least those few lives. Everything that you need. But if you're a person who's going to take what Jesus gives you and, and just say thank you Lord and, and sit there and, and be prayerful and, and be in gratitude but but to do nothing with it other than, other than to, to pat yourself on the back and assure yourself of your own salvation. There's, there's no reason for Jesus to invest in that. He will. He'll give you a chance. Because I think 
that if you have the opportunity to experience his love, there is a chance that even if you start out with only one measure of love and faith, that you will take that one measure of love and faith and maybe you'll change one person's life. And in changing one person's life, then you have just a little bit more. And maybe with that just a little bit more, you can build up to the next level and the next level. Because you see, the thing is, this faith thing really does multiply and this love thing really does multiply. And just because you may not feel like you're a global, world-changing Christian right now, maybe you're just that local-level Christian, if you change things on the local level, and then all of their lives, and they all begin to change things on their local levels, then that begins to change things on a county level, and the county begins to change things on a state level, and the state begins to change the country, and the country begins to change the world. And even though you may have only started with the talent and the measure of faith, Two, eventually that multiplies and gets up there and changes the world as well. I don't know that I am a Mother Teresa or Pope John Paul or Martin Luther King Jr. or John Wesley level Christian. I don't believe that hundreds of years from now people will be talking about my name and saying how much of an impact on the world that I had. But I know that there is a desire in my heart to change this world. And it is greater than just changing your lives. It is greater than just changing the lives of the people in this community. It is a desire and a hope and a faith that I can change the very fabric of our society on behalf of Jesus Christ and in the name of Jesus Christ so that the world may come to know the God that I know and love, the God that fills me with a passion and a fire and a desire for life, for a hope of a brighter future. I may not be a five-talent Christian, but whatever talents I have, whether it's two or three or four or whatever, I know that if I continue to invest those love and invest that time and invest my energy in, in you all and in the community and in other people that that talent will grow and that there will be more in the world and that God's kingdom will be made reality because of the lives transformed. And I hope I hope that some of you have that desire too. I hope that you want to see the world change, or at the very least, this community change, and that you're willing to work with me, and together we can multiply our talents, and we can change this community, and we can change the world. You, and you, each of you, in the power of Jesus, can change the world if you invest the love and faith that he's given you. And you put it out there. And you trust that he's going with you. May we be a church filled with five measures of faith and love. A church filled with those kind of disciples because if we can be that church then we can be a church that the world begins to notice and people will begin to say, what is in the water in northern Pennsylvania because something is different about those folks and there is something going on there and it is clear that Christ is a very much alive there and that lives are being transformed there and we want to be a part of it. We want to learn from them. We want to see Jesus as they see Jesus. And if we live as five with five measures of love and faith in our lives, and we acted like we trusted God and we were going to put all of that into this world, then it'll happen. He won't let it fail. That is my prayer for us. That we become a church that is so, so heavily invested in the lives of others that the world can't help but notice that Jesus is very much alive here. And now.